I'm Brazilian, and I'll talk to you about a glaring problem from my country. I guess this picture speaks for itself. Um, it's a real picture from a Brazilian photographer that shows how inequality is a big issue, but not only in Brazil. According to Oxfam, uh, last year, 82% of the wealth went to only 1% of the population. And that's a second image, also from my country, that shows another problem that we definitely must tackle. This is an image from the rainforest, the Amazon, that is being absolutely devastated. And we have 7 million hectares of forest that is lost every year which leads to climate change, to soil depletion, to um, so many problems that we already know. And it leads me to ask you a question, which is how do we protect people and planet at the same time? Um, Kate Rayworth made a very good summary of how to tackle those two uh, issues in this format of a donut maybe some of you have already seen. It actually combines the planetary boundaries that were created by the Stockholm Resilience Centres, you know, those that we should not cross in terms of uh, CO2 emissions in order to make sure we stay under the two degrees. And she added up to that the social foundations, what she calls this, which are the standards that we should um, achieve in order to make sure that the life on the planet is not only sustainable, but worth living. And actually, meeting this equation, like between the social and on, on the environmental, is becoming increasingly difficult because uh, we are basically living in a time where the impact of humanity on the ecosystem is accelerating. Every year, we use more resources than the Earth can provide, and we do that earlier every year. We are um, currently... Oops. We are currently um, depleting our carbon budget. The carbon budget is like how much carbon we can emit in order to stay within the limits of the Paris Agreement. You know, there's a two degree objective and a 1.5 degree objective, which is really necessary if we want to avoid a tipping point and avoid, for instance, that the permafrost makes the climate go completely crazy. So we need to stay within, but we have maybe one year, maybe 10 years left is very, very uh, little. So when looking at all these challenges, basically there's two options and two roads. The first one is to look at it only on the neg negative side and think that basically we won't manage to, um, to curb the, um, uh, the impact and we only go on marginal and incremental improvements. And that might lead us to a complete disaster, climate disaster. Even some people are talking about civilization collapse or even the extension of humanity. That is very serious. But we could frame it. There's a second way because that's not the way I'm, I'm the most excited with. We could frame it. Uh, otherwise, we could frame it as the most important challenge and the most important innovation opportunity in our lifetimes, which is to meet this equation in, a, in this very, very complicated time. So, uh, by training, I'm an engineer. So, when I was at university, there was one thing that really struck me is when we were uh, told about Moore's law, uh, the law that Gordon Moore, the, f the founder of Intel, um, when he said that in the 60s, we are going to have the computing power who's going to double every 18 months in the future. There are three th funny things about that. The first is that it, it actually happened. The second is that this law also was extended to other sectors, not only computing, but for instance in biology, DNA writing and sequencing is even going faster than Moore's law. And the third thing is that, um, in fact, the, this law was never based on any natural force or any legal constraint. It just was a way for the industry, the innovators, to say, this is where we want to go, let's do it. This was a heuristic, a golden rule, if you will. So the question is, like, could we make another golden rule like that? And there, where it comes, the carbon law, which actually shows that if we pick on the carbon emissions, latest on 2020, and halve the emissions every decade, while at the same time removing carbon from the atmosphere, land, and oceans, maybe we'll have 60-60% chance of staying under the two degrees of increase in the global warming. But to achieve that, what can we do? It's really, really important that we get there in order to avoid this looming scenario that Benjamin just described. And how can we do, at the same time, attend and meet the needs of everyone while staying within the meaning of the planet? 
And it was with the goal of researching more about it and understanding what are the tools that we have and that we can use to tackle those goals that we launched uh, last year, this uh, company called Good Tech Lab, which is currently doing a research for the past year, we interviewed around 400 innovators, including impact investors, accelerators, uh, startups, entrepreneurs, scientists, in 30 countries of the five continents, with the support of great partners and a beautiful team from Brazil and France. And we will have, as an outcome, two reports that are going to be published very soon, the first one in November, uh, seeing how tech can be useful to tackle those big problems and how is the ecosystem structured? And I guess we're going to discuss that uh, afterwards, also after this session. How can we help those entrepreneurs that are working in this intersection between tech and impact? So for me, uh, I have a background in international development. And it was then evident that we should use the sustainable development goals as a framework because they represent a common agenda or a roadmap of the problems we need to tackle um, in order to ensure a good life on this planet by 2030. So what we are going to do is actually seeing for each of the sustainable goals, um, what are the targets and how can we use technology to tackle each of them. So seeing a couple of trends in each of the goals, what we'll do now is give maybe some examples. Yeah, and for instance, if we take the food sector, food is like a massive contributor for climate change, for pollution of soils, of water, and we're going to have to, to feed 10 billion people in 2050, while the system we have in place to feed 7 billion is already highly unsustainable. So how are we going to do it? Well, first, there's a low-hanging fruit, which is tackle the issue of food waste. Food waste, there's two ways to look at it. In developed countries, it mostly happens at the retail and consumption sector, so there's a lot of apps and systems trying to tackle those. In developing countries, uh, the most of the problem happens between harvests and where it reaches the retail and cons consumption point. So it's super critical to improve conservation systems and to develop new ways to preserve and to extend the shelf life of foods. So there's a few companies doing that in very ingenious way, for instance, using membranes, uh, bio-based membranes and edible membranes that you could uh, wrap around uh, vegetables and fruits to extend the shelf lives. Another critical issue is to target smallholder farmers. In developing countries, smallholder farmers account for approximately 80% of the food production in these countries. They are also among the world's, the world's poorest, and they're going to have to increase their production while making a decent living and while uh, not trashing the planet, basically. So there's a few uh, companies and projects targeting this population, for instance, with a technology project to uh, help them to share information about how to grow food in the best way, how to share tools and information and insights about their soils, about the weather, uh, also, uh, companies targeting the financing of such exploitations by um, basically providing better credit system targeted to these populations, but also interesting approach that combine um, regenerative agri agriculture, such as sinicoculture, it's like very similar to permaculture, and using a data-driven approach with the biodiversity data, artificial intelligence, augmented reality to be able to understand better what are the factors that make that uh, successful. So Sony actually has a lab working on, on this uh, in Burkina Faso. It's extremely interesting. Um, another big area is finding the way to phase out harmful uh, pesticides and synthetic fertilizers, which are completely uh, destroying our soils and causing a lot of water pollution. Uh, there's a lot of interesting approaches, for instance, using the genetic information and the microbiome of plants and the soils to increase the natural defenses of plants and soils against uh, pesticides, and also to, s to fix nitrogen from the air directly uh, in the plant to not uh, have any need for, for fertilizers. Um, and then, I mean, we're both vegetarians, uh, and we, the um, animal agriculture is one of the biggest contributors to uh, uh, environmental uh, negative impacts. And the thing is, like, there are already a lot of products for people who are vegetarians and can uh, eat uh, meat substitutes, but there's still a large part of the population that really crave for meat. And with an increase of the um, livelihoods in emerging countries, it's going to be even bigger. So we need to find a way to deliver meat without having to raise the animal with all the animal cruelty and the environmental impact. So there's a lot of companies doing that and producing uh, uh, meat without uh, cows, without chicken, uh, dairy products. Uh, and basically, it's like growing uh, meat like you would grow beer, basically, a little more uh, elaborate. 
Um, and maybe the last sector I wanted to tell you about beyond agriculture is something that's called the new carbon economy. It's a new concept, a new world that has been emerging over the past year. And it's about stopping to see carbon as only negative. Carbon is negative when it goes out in the atmosphere. But if it's stored in materials, in the soils, in trees, in forests, it's actually very good. It's part of, of life. And the new carbon economy is like basically the circular economy for carbon. It's like how you can create an economy that traps more carbon into uh, the soil and materials than it emits. And there's different companies targeting that from uh, technology enhanced reforestation to a blockchain based marketplace to basically help uh, farmers that sequester carbon in the soil to um, uh, invest into these new practices from direct air capture of carbon and even storing uh, permanently carbon within construction materials, for instance. So these are only just a few of these growing impact tech movement. That is a convergence between tech and impact entrepreneurship. And we think it's really one of the biggest opportunities and the most historical movement of our lifetime. And they can really help to bend uh, uh, the curve in the right direction. And it's going to be probably some of the biggest economic opportunity of our lifetimes. We're going to discuss that in, in, a, in a lot of detail in, a, in the coming uh, session. However, uh, we don't want to give you the impression that we believe that tech can solve all the challenges we have. It's quite easy to fall in the trap of techno-solutionism, but that's not the way to go. We are very aware that we need much more as an ecosystem beyond the technology and science in itself to solve the challenges that we need to tackle. So, including behavioral change, including policy, including the support of each and every one of us who is here today. Someone el something else that is also very important when you consider technology um, is who is producing it. One of the key issues that we see is that technology is currently being produced by one unique certain type of people, not only, but mainly. And that's something that we should change, unless we want to fell on what Katie and you very correctly described as the weapons of ma mass destructions, referring to the biases of algorithms. And those algorithms are more and more taking the decisions on our uh, place. So if we don't want them to be biased and if we want them to really think about everyone, then we definitely need to include more diversity into technology and science. There are many people, luckily for us, already working on this movement, and that's definitely something that should be supported. Another big issue when we think about technology is the way we make and dispose of electronic objects. Many of us may already know, but the coltan, which is an important material, mineral, that is in many of our cell phones nowadays, come from a terrible situations you know, in mining and mainly in the Republic Democratic of Congo, but in any case, ma most of the products that we have contain products that actually will just be disposed afterwards as if they were not even valued in the first place. We must change that. We cannot just dispose of products as if they were not important. We must think in a circular way and stop with the linear thinking of I will produce, use and dispose, and start thinking as uh, Ellen MacArthur quite well uh, resumes with her graphic on the circular economy. And <coughs> so despite all that, we can feel in this event today and in, in several others that there is a lot of energy and optimism. There's a lot of people that uh, create projects and incredible companies to try to target all these challenges. And we think we need basically like everyone each and every one of you in this room, in this event, has part of the key that can help us to prevent the looming disaster and to bend the curve toward like a, a scenario where it's going to be like prosperous within the limits uh, of our planet. And I just want to make a quick call to action to different, uh, to each and every one of you. So entrepreneurs, I mean, you have a lot on opportunities. We just discussed a few of them. You can make an impact unicorn, a super niche, deep science company. You can make a company that's going to replicate uh, solutions that are already proven everywhere. There's many different ways to build a company to have an impact. Scientists get out of the, of the lab and try to work with social entrepreneurs, startups, entrepreneurs to try to, pri to find a commercial application for your invention that can really uh, improve the world. Accelerators, incubators, and so on. You are at the front line of like supporting on a day-to-day basis some of the companies. Um, and you should uh, try to, as much as possible, help them to spot what are the right problems to solve, what are, what are the biggest opportunities, prevent them from, from working on something that's meaningless, a gadget, or anything. And maybe 
learn about impact evaluation, impact measurement, and help them and coach them about how to evaluate the impact of, of their companies. Corporates, you guys, you don't want to be the next Kodak, I guess. So you need to find a way to both at the same time reduce drama dramatically, bring to zero your net impact. At the same time, you need to learn to be part of a solution. And my feeling is that you're going to need the help of entrepreneurs and innovators to do that. So learn to work better with them, to adapt your sales process, your procurement process, to work with them in the most efficient way. Foundations. Foundations are here basically to bridge the market failures and the gaps. So they can invest in the crazy early stage project when nobody believes in them. They can fund uh, science, they can fund impact management, they can bring their systemic perspective of social and environmental problems to, to help people to understand the, 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 the root cause of, uh, of problems. Governments, they need to stop looking short term and questions like how should we divide 50 refugees around among a few countries? But government was uh, invented to think long term. We need to come back to the era where we were able to invest in the internet, in the Apollo program, and basically giving a direction to innovation with like all the incentives uh, are like tax, investing in research, and so on. This is what Mariano Mazzucato from uh, UCL calls mission-driven innovation. She just uh, sent a report to the uh, EU Commission on that. Citizens, you need to vote with your wallet, with your votes, and your time to work on such projects. And finally, and I'm going to transition to the, se to the session on that, investors, you guys are the experts at turning the biggest challenge into the most incredible opportunities. So find the, the best project, support them, and help them to, to get to incredible scale. I'm going to close on that. I'm very happy to have introduced this super important session. If you're interested in what we do, please uh, be happy to share our, our report with you. Have a great day at ChangeDog. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.